Those no, are two no, different you no, no, you got it right. No, Crino is judgment and Sozo or Sodzo as it's pronounced. Sodzo. So yeah. um, the root of that is to heal or to make whole. And uh, it's used dozens of times in the New Testament. It's used uh, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, especially when uh, a healing miracle is described. So in Mark 5, we find it when um, the woman touches the hem of his garment and is made whole. Matthew tells the same story in Matthew 9. Both cases, you've been sozoed, you've been healed or made whole. We find it in the story of the blind man in Mark 10, uh, repeated in Matthew 18. God touches his eyes, he makes him whole, sozo. But what, what is most significant to me is when we get to Luke, and the story in Luke 7 of the woman who is forgiven for her many sins, Christ uses the identical phrase. Your faith has made you whole. You've been sozoed, so to speak. And so to me, that's one of the key indicators in the New Testament that that word sozo is meant to encompass a range of healing from physical to emotional to spiritual. Okay, folks, welcome back to The Last Dispensation. I am your host, Troy, and I have a very special guest. Do you go by Professor Givens? Brother or Givens, Professor Brother Givens, Givens? Okay. Carol, <laughs> any of them are fine. Anything like that. Okay. Um, and I'm really happy to have him uh, on the program. I ordered your book, Faith and Intellect, and I read it with my wife because she's the... Uh, the walking thesaurus and i am not it's it's a lot of word salad for me so i have to dissect it and read it over and over again because my processor isn't very fast but then i go oh i get what he's saying i get it and it's good stuff it's really really good stuff and uh we're going to talk about that we're going to talk about the interview that you and your wife did with uh professor fluman on the book um, entitled The Christ Who Heals, which I am excited to get, uh, and I want to read that. But let's start off with your bio here. Uh, Terrell Givens did graduate work in intellectual history at Cornell and in comparative literature at UNC Chapel Hill, where he received his PhD. He is Professor Emeritus of Literature and Religion at the University of Richmond, and the Neil A. Maxwell Senior Research Fellow. Now, a senior research fellow, is that like a contributor, or you're, you're just a, a senior member of a board? Uh, no, it's a, a research faculty position, which means it's a full-time appointment, uh, faculty-level appointment, but I don't actively teach classes. I do research and write and, and contribute in other ways. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Um, and that is at Brigham Young University. His numerous books include A History of Latter-day Saint Theology, Wrestling the Angel and Feeding the Flock with Oxford University Press, and several studies of LDS scripture, culture, biography, and history. The New York Times has called his scholarship provocative reading, and he has been a commentator on LDS topics on PBS, CNN, NPR, with his wife, Fiona. He has published several books that celebrate the restored gospel. They travel frequently to speak on the topic of finding faith in trying times. He is currently at work on a history of Christian love. I like that. Okay, so welcome. I'm sure you know uh, that there are those who can write and there are those who can speak. And then the, there's those who do both like you. Uh, I think I'm a pretty smart guy, but then I have to, I have to uh, put it in pin and that helps me uh, or, you know, organize my thoughts here. So uh, my first uh, question, so from what I read um, in faith and intellect, it kind of begins with you making the point that throughout Christian history, science and religion were cohesive subjects. It wasn't until the Age of Enlightenment 
we begin seeing them as a dichotomy. Am I right? Yeah, and the the real pitched battle doesn't really begin until the late 1800s. It's in the aftermath of Darwin. Um, it's a battle that is more fabricated than inevitable. Uh, you have a number of intellectuals. The most famous one was Andrew White, who was president of Cornell, wrote a famous book on the, the, the conflict between science and religion. And so there was kind of a hyped up conflict between religion and science that was uh, it was more kind of a PR campaign by people who wanted science to claim a kind of monopoly on uh, on human knowledge and ways of knowing. Um, and it continues to some extent to the present day, although surveys by Forbes magazine and other researchers have found that actually faith is just about as common among scientists as is unbelief. So would you say that people today are maybe just as religious as they were uh, four or 500 years ago? Well, I think what happens is we have, I think, a very weak series of instruments to measure that question. You know, the uh, the famous surveys that we keep seeing showing the rise of the nuns, all those surveys are telling us is that people are not claiming formal institutional affiliation anymore. That doesn't really tell us what's happening at the level of, of, of real faith, real belief. And I think that's been a problem ever since uh, the fourth century. When, uh, you know, for the first four centuries, if you're a Christian, you know you're committed. Why? Because you're putting your life at stake and your livelihood at stake and you're subject to persecution and, and marginalization. And, and then once Christianity becomes the religion of the empire, suddenly being a Christian gives you social capital. And to some extent, that continues even today in America. Try running for president if you're an atheist, for example. Right. So there, there are, are ways in which we, I think we may have overestimated, we may have exaggerated the extent of religious disaffiliation uh, because people are just, I think, fed up with its institutional forms. I, I find it interesting. You talk about an abiding faith in the face of secularism's challenges, reasonable and sustainable. The result of our journey will affirm two facts. Our intellect can feed our spirit and our spirit can feed our intellect. Why are some people, let's just say people in the church, why do they look at intellect as kind of a scary thing? There is a certain demographic that uh, I mean, there's good intellectualism. I think we're all smart enough to understand that. But there's kind of this fear that intellectualism can challenge orthodoxy. Do you understand yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think a lot of that just has to do with who wins the who's winning the PR wars at any given moment. <laughs> and, you know, about 20 years ago, there we saw the rise of this movement called the New Atheism you know, with Hitchens and Dawkins and and Sam Harris and others. And suddenly uh, Christianity just became a popular target uh, of caricature. And so what we saw were a number of really highly placed public intellectuals who rendered a kind of comic book version of religion, uh, which they attacked. And sold millions of books and made millions of dollars uh, pretending to kind of be these, these new discoverers of all of the evils of, of Christianity throughout history. And so I think in the public imagination, in the media, uh, in, in the most recent generation, there's been a real wedding of self-proclaimed intellectuals and anti-religious expression and sentiment. So I think that's, that's one uh, factor in this, uh, what I think is more of a mirage. And I, 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 it's also the case, right, that uh, the 19th century did see a number of developments which made conventional belief, fundamentalism especially, uh, untenable, right? Uh, geology developed uh, irrefutable proof that the earth was millions and millions of years old. Uh, Darwin found ways of explaining, of accounting for the emergence of various species without having recourse to special creation. So uh, in the words of one scholar, uh, he made atheism intellectually respectable. So it's, it's possible today 
to turn to science and believe that it answers those questions that religion traditionally has. And in that way, again, one can see a kind of inherent risk that uh, immersion in science and, and intellect uh, create. Do you mind if we jump over to the Christ who heals for a second? Sure. Okay. Because I think it kind of relates. We're talking about, I know the Renaissance period is probably between 1400 to about 1700 till the yeah. beginning of the age of enlightenment, oh, right. would you say? Yeah. Yeah. Roughly. And it's funny. We call it the age of enlightenment because it's kind of an oxymoron when you think about it. <laughs> okay. So we have the dark ages. What was the dark ages? What well, would you call ages, the dark ages? Dark ages is another name that we often give to the middle ages, generally the period from 400 to 1400. It's a, it's a label that most scholars don't won't use anymore because it largely was a product of those people who were infatuated, infatuated with classical civilization, right? The, the, the Renaissance humanists. Petrarch, I think, was maybe the first to use the term. So as they're looking back at history, they're saying, oh, the great glory days were the days of Greece and Rome. Right, and right. Capturing those now. So everything in between were dark ages. Which is interesting because we had civility before we had non-civility. And then we come back to civility again around uh, the late 1500s to the early 1600s. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, it's also the case that like there's a recent uh, book, I forget the scholar's name, but it's called The Light Ages, which is a refutation of all of the stereotypes about that period, uh, demonstrating that that in many cases, universities flourished, uh, science flourished, astronomy flourished. So uh, it's uh, just, again, another example of a bad press that, uh, that those centuries. Can you elaborate a little bit on the different the differences between eastern and western christianity i was fascinated especially when you got into some esoteric tenets that we have lost and there's proof of it in in eastern uh in the eastern christian church and uh they were more uh polytheistic right they uh, well, well they see, believed in in a kind of a godhead that we believe today uh it was it was as yeah, latter-day saints sorry, they were not but. quite as wedded to the kind of trinitarian thought that we find in the less although generally there was a consensus there the main difference is that right the first four centuries of christianity there's not really an orthodoxy there's not an established church there aren't creeds there isn't uh, unanimity on a lot of key doctrines and ideas. So that all comes about through the first church councils at Nicaea and, and Chalcedon. But mostly what happens is toward the end of the fourth, beginning of the fifth century, this bishop from Carthage, uh, Augustine by name, comes on the scene. So we're like 400 AD. Around right? 400 AD. Okay. And he two or three major developments that take place largely at his hands. One is the elaboration of the doctrine of original sin. Now, there'd been some ideas about a kind of universal, you know, death, uh, consequences of what happened in the Garden of Eden. But he is the one that articulates this fully fledged doctrine of a universal uh, depravity, a, a, a corrupted nature, and of a universal guilt that we inherit. In articulating this doctrine, he has to dismiss what until then had been a universally held idea, which was that of human free will. And so free will in any meaningful sense, as we would understand the, the, the term, essentially evaporates at the hands of Augustine. So we get predestination, we get salvation by grace alone, independent of any work or merit, and we get this catastrophe of original sin. Now, he's, a, he's, he's writing in Latin. He's a part of the Western Church. The Eastern Church is already becoming differentiated on a number of doctrinal points. The formal rift doesn't come until the 11th century. But the Eastern Church never buys into the Augustinian Revolution. And so from their perspective, they would say, well, what you have is Augustinian Christianity or Western Christianity, mm -hmm. right, based in Rome. Right. There's the Orthodox tradition or the Eastern Christian tradition. And 
Latter-day Saints would find that they have a lot more in common with the Orthodox tradition than really with anything in either the Catholic or Protestant worldviews. For example, the Eastern tradition never buys the original sin. Was that Greek uh, and Russian Orthodox? Yes, that's right. Okay. And um, they maintain alive the doctrine of theosis that in some sense, not exactly the same as Latter-day Saints, but the Eastern tradition to this day believes in some important sense we are becoming divine. And there's a process of sanctification and divinization that is going on. Uh, it's much more common in the Eastern tradition to believe in a kind of universal access to salvation. Some of their more prominent theologians, like David Bentley Hart, have written books uh, in which they argue that, of course, everybody will be saved. God would be a failure or unjust if he didn't provide the means for every man, woman, child to come home to him. So those are some of the more, I think, important trends in, in the Orthodox tradition that align more neatly with re restoration thinking than the West. You mentioned a, a, a few things that the Eastern Church believed that were that aligned with some of the tenets that we have. Going well, all they, the way back. They believed in pre a, a pre pre-mortal existence? Well, they did early on. Um, Origen, one of the church fathers who's writing in third century, uh, Alexandria, he is the, the most, he does the most work expounding a doctrine of pre-mortal existence. Okay. Some of his successors um, will inherit that belief, but in general, the Eastern church abandons that idea as well as, uh, as well as the West does. But I think the most beautiful idea in Eastern Orthodoxy, and it's traceable to, to both origin and then to somebody like Gregory of Nyssa, who's a, a fourth century Eastern father, is what's called the theology of ascent. So it's this belief, again, very familiar to Latter-day Saints, that we are involved in an eternal educative process. So God didn't create perfect Adam and Eve, and then they fell. God puts mortals into this sphere in order to be subjected to the vicissitudes and the trials and the educative experiences of life, and we are engaged in what we would call eternal progress. But what, uh, what they refer to as uh, the theology of ascent, that it's endless, it's eternal, we are always moving in the direction of a perfection that God Trial is and error. and sharing. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. You say that the apostasy uh, took much later than, than it took place in the West, but it did eventually take place. You know, apostasy is one of those terms that Latter-day Saint scholars are coming to radically reinterpret and reassess. Um, if you're a believing Latter-day Saint, then it's clear that in some sense, important things were lost and important things were restored. But I, I think the best thinking on the topic uh, inclines to the direction that there isn't one decisive moment and there isn't- It's a, a gradual eclipse. thing, right? A gradual thing and it's erratic, it's hit and miss. I mean, some truths persist throughout the, the, the period, uh, all the way down. I mean, I think there are still some aspects of Eastern Orthodoxy, and uh, I think one can find elements of Catholicism and Protestantism alike, where uh, they get a lot of things really beautifully right. Um, uh, so I think that it's, it's more, it's an uneven process of kind of derailment of some of the early uh, primal truths that were part of the earliest Christian centuries. But there was never a time in Christian history when you know, we couldn't go back as Latter-day Saints to any moment in the Christian past and say, oh, this is recognizable as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, because we have a lot of doctrines in the Restoration that were never really part of an original Christian vision. For example, the right. family. We can't find evidence that that was taught anywhere at any time or place. Well, almost like the the things that we do in the temple today, there's this one side that believes there are scholars in the church that believe that these were and and even well, you you probably know this, that they were there are eternal truths that were lost. And then some believe that Heavenly Father basically gave revelation to Joseph Smith saying, you know, make a suitable endowment. And if you need to use masonry as something to 
make something work as a, as the catalyst for that, you know, that's okay. But then there's others believe, no, these are, these are things that were done in antiquity. You know? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. In the 19th that, century, well, yeah, know. the 19th century, there was a widespread belief uh, in among the Masons, right. And others that there was a direct lineal descent from the temple ceremonies of Solomon's day to these, you know, it's resurrection or restitution, reconstitution in the 18th, 19th centuries. And Joseph Smith probably participated in that mythology that was, right, a part of his cultural environment. Um, but it's it's much more likely, I mean, just in our, in the last 50 years, those of us old enough to remember, right, have seen fairly substantial changes in the temple endowment, right? right? So that seems just proof dispositive that we are not working with an original ceremony that has just kind of been slightly tinkered with over the years. The, the, the idea of covenants, covenant keeping, and the depiction of some kind of eternal uh, path that the human soul embarks on uh, may hark all the way back to antiquity. But uh, yeah, I, I think as far as I'm concerned, Joseph Smith could have used Cub Scout signs, and <laughs> mottos, and right, it, right, it didn't right. matter because it, it just needed to be a shell, a form. We could have went like this, you know, or through whatever. Which, through which the covenants could be. Yeah. yeah. And that's making more sense to me as I mature in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope I'm maturing in the gospel. I grew up. Okay. So I was born in 1971. I went on my mission in 92. I was a Joseph. Well, I still am a Joseph Fielding Smith, Bruce R. McConkie member of the church, but I'm, I'm not saying I'm not anymore, but I am, I guess I'm, I, I think the savior wants us to broaden something up here that there, and it was, it wasn't until five years ago that I started realizing as I was introduced to fair Latter-day Saint and, uh, you know, uh, the Faith Matters and uh, the Maxwell Institute. I don't agree with everything that goes on, but I learned that there's more complexities and nuances that are good and that there weren't. And, and then I, I realized that, oh, there were leaders of the church and apostles and prophets that didn't always uh, agree on things. <laughs> there were the scholars over here and there were and the educators and there were the insurance salesmen and 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 the the attorneys over here and they sat together as 12 and a first presidency but came together in their committees with the spirit and came to some uh conclusion on things do you know what i'm saying yeah yeah some of us <laughs> miss those days when uh, the brethren were more comfortable disagreeing with one another in public <laughs> and so you could have tirades against evolution and science then you could have defenses of evolution and science right and you know i think there was something healthy about that that there's a, a human dimension a subjective dimension to how we understand and receive uh the contributions of uh modern science and and uh but today, uh, the brethren have decided that that harmony and uh, a public facing uh, presentation of unity is more important. And so that's that's what we see. Yeah, exactly. I OK, so let's get back into this real quick. Uh, is there proof that we've lost some things like, you know, ordinances and and other tenants um, from the early church? Through the apostasy that we have today um and if so why why do so many protestants and evangelicals that go to seminaries and study uh the history of christianity overlook that do they look at these men that made these yeah. statements as heretics that bring up things that that click with us as latter-day saints and we go oh that's what we believe yeah i think uh let me know if this if this addresses the question you're asking it seems to okay. me one, one of the most fundamental ways of differentiating Latter-day Saint theology from Catholic and Protestant theology alike is in terms of covenant theology. Um, you know, we have the Old Covenant, the New Covenant, the Old Testament, the New Testament. All of the Christian world 
without exception, as far as I know, embraces this model for understanding Christian history, that there was an old covenant. It was a covenant of works. It was a covenant of obedience. It was given to Adam in the garden. Then it was reiterated with Noah and then with Moses. And we failed in that covenant. We violated the law in the garden. We violated the law as, as God's covenant people. And so that is replaced, absolutely replaced by the new covenant, the covenant of grace, the covenant instituted by Christ, his coming, and the gospel he preaches. Latter-day Saints uh, are outside of that entire framework of understanding, because our conception is, no, there has to be a unification of the old and the new. And so you see this most explicitly in the Book of Mormon, where they're keeping the law of Moses, but they're anticipating the coming of Christ. They offer sacrifice, but they also believe in a Savior who is to come. Uh, our temple theology, right, traces the gospel, as does the Book of Moses, all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And so it's, it's, uh, it's perfectly understandable why uh, an observant Catholic or or Protestant would believe, for example, that the temple served a purpose in antiquity, but there is no need to reinstitute the temple or preserve its rituals into the New Testament era and beyond. And that's, for example, a point of difference, right? Latter-day Saints would point out, well, Peter and John are still worshiping in the temple. Mm -hmm. We now know a number of scholars are working in the area of early uh, temple studies, and, and realize, wait, the temple played a role in the early Christian church, and then it just kind of disappears without any explanation. And so Latter-day Saints would point to that as an example of something that was lost and needs to be reconstituted, where other Christians are more comfortable saying, no, we've moved beyond that. That, into, that was the old law. You know, that always, was the old law. The old yeah. Law. That we are the temple of God. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of hyperbole there, too. Uh, which brings me to page 54. Let's jump back to faith and intellect. Uh, restoration scriptures attribute to Eve a crucial role in the plan of human embodiment. She did not doom her posterity, but courageously opened the door of mortality to all, which I, I've been even finding that more as I attend the temple and not to get into the, the sacredness of it, but uh, even with that, in the last several years, I see in, in the depictions of Eve, she, it's not some, uh, oops, I, I did something wrong. It is Adam, aren't you going to keep all of God's commandments? <laughs> and, and she is the one that introduces, uh, the opening of, of the windows of heaven and a progression out, out of the garden of Eden and out of a, uh, and innocence that they would stay in forever. That's right. Yeah, this is really one of the most remarkable things about the Book of Mormon that doesn't seem to have been noticed by anybody for the first hundred years of the church's history, almost. Um, you know, Brigham Young famously said that when he convinced himself that the Book of Mormon was true and consistent with New Testament teachings in every regard, that's when he decided to join the church. So most early Latter-day Saints saw the Book of Mormon as simply reaffirming uh, the first principles and ordinances of the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, the single most striking difference between the uh, conventional Christian reading of the past and, and the Book of Mormon reading of the past is in that story of what happens in the garden. And we have Book of Mormon prophets who affirm that what happened was a good thing that uh, we couldn't have had posterity, the purposes of God couldn't have been fulfilled if Eve hadn't eaten of the fruit, and then that's made even more explicit in the book of Moses, which comes about shortly thereafter. Uh, I, I think that's uh, one of the most remarkable innovations or restorations in LDS thinking. You know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, probably the most famous feminist of the 19th century, she mm -hmm. wrote a book called The Woman's Bible, and in it, she said, Christianity is never going to sort itself out and do justice to women until two great reforms take place. One, we have to have a feminine counterpart to Heavenly Father. Mm 
And two, we have to give Eve her due place in the history of the human race. And I think it's just really remarkable that the restoration did exactly those two things. Heaven isn't a patriarchal monopoly and Eve is the heroine rather than criminal uh, of human history. Yeah. And you can see that with Joseph Smith and you can see that with Jesus Christ. One's a prophet and one was a prophet and the son of God. But they both, we see in in the New Testament and in in the history of the church, women played a role. Women played a role. And then we kind of uh, progressed out of that. And now we're coming back to where they're, well, they've always played a role, but yeah, but we haven't done. Yeah, we haven't done a good job of um, celebrating and recognizing and explicating the importance of, of where the backbone of the church really the, is. <laughs> well, I mean, the women were the first to proclaim the resurrection, right? It was right. Mary and the others who went to the tomb, and they were given that that commission. Effect. There's a demographic in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints that is afraid of intellectualism of academia. Um, What would you say to those folks who have a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but don't quite understand? It's all, it's almost like there's, you have the, the educated and intellectuals, and then you have those who are the, the tradesmen, but they're still educated in life. Uh, It, but we're on the same team yet. We're speaking a different language language but saying the same thing (laughs) yeah i don't i don't i yeah i I imagine that division uh that divide might be felt differently by different people and and different times and places and you know it would be the fault of the so-called scholars of the church if if they are giving uh others reason to feel that in any way their contributions their place in life isn't equally important but in terms of the balance of, of faith and intellect, I would say there, there are two uh, testimonies, it seems to me, that we have to the importance of integrating those two components in, into the life fully lived. One of those is historical, uh, right? From, from the, the, the earliest days of the church, Joseph went to extraordinary lengths to create institutions of learning, right? Whether it was the, the school of Hebrew, or the school of the prophets, school or the prophets. university of Nauvoo, uh, setting up a printing press. Um, so that's the that's the first testimony we have to the importance of pursuing uh, education and and uh, a life of learning. Joseph Smith is a prophet, and yet he's studying German and Hebrew and Egyptian, um, understanding that. Uh, even the gift of prophecy has to be supplemented by the hard sweat and toil of intellectual effort. And then I'd say the other testimony we have is that of scripture itself, because we're, we find this phrase so often in modern revelation, I will tell you in your heart and in your mind. And so that seems to be a pretty explicit uh, reference on the part of the Lord to the duality of, uh, of our souls, that we, there's a component which responds affectively to emotion, to intimations of the heart. And there's a part that responds rationally. And ideally we bring those two into alignment and they supplement and support each other. Beautiful. Yeah, it, Joseph Smith, um, I'm paraphrasing, but didn't he say that language was broken? He yeah, wanted, he, yet he le- wanted more of it. Yeah, in <laughs> a letter he, wanted he, to express he wrote it. about his frustrations of being imprisoned in this broken language yeah. um and yet he i had, have the quote somewhere but i can't remember yeah. how it went but yet he wanted more of it so that he could express the desires that he he wanted to express to uh the saints and uh, and when you think about revelation is nothing without intellect right words that were dictated and notated to make the book of mormon or the doctrine and covenants Without words, without intellect, we can't interpret those revelations. Well, right. And we're told in the in the first revelation, the Doctrine and Covenants, that God has to speak according to our language, according to our understanding. 
that seems to me a way of saying that his ability to communicate with us is limited by our ability to hear and to listen. He can't speak in a vacuum. And I think that's one reason why Joseph Smith was continually trying to expand his own mind. Um, he read voluminously. Uh, we have records of books that he donated to the Nauvoo Library. He owned two books on Catholic piety. He owned books on um, Methodist devotion. He owned books on the debate over the nature of the free will. <clears throat> so clearly this is a prophet who felt that he could be more useful as an instrument of revelation if he himself had a richer conceptual vocabulary. I think my wife and I were reading your book together and you talk about all the education they had in, in was it Nauvoo? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, even after Joseph Smith uh, was martyred, it continued to go on. And uh, it had, was it Br Brigham Young that said that we need to educate these people as much as possible. They need to get learning before they trek, before they right. go to, yeah. go yeah. ahead, sorry. No, no, just that. And um, right, there's a long record of Latter-day Saints having an abnormally high level of education uh, compared to the national averages in, uh, in the United States, at least. I love this. You're you're talking about God being individually interested in us and us being on our own programs, that he's invested in us individually, like a violin maestro teacher who aspires to mentor his student to a comparable status God shepherds us through instruction, development, growth, and education with the goal of making us like him and herself, playing music as beautifully as they in imitation of the gift and beauty and not echoing the same score. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I think, you know, John Calvin, uh, Luther's contemporary, introduces, reintroduces a conception of God as absolutely sovereign and he's very emphatic in saying that god plots out to infinitesimal detail everything that is going to transpire in the world nothing happens except that which he ordained and so that's true on the global as well as the personal level for a calvinist and a lot of times as latter-day saints i think we imbibe that same notion which uh, I, I think is a rather sad and limiting notion about human nature and human possibilities. In other words, we tend to think, what does God want me to do at this moment? What does he want me to do at this moment? As if there's a script and we're trying to act out that script that God has created for us. And uh, I, that's just not the image that I have. That's not the image that I get when I read scripture or, or Joseph Smith's writings about human destinies and possibilities. I think it makes more sense to say God's given us this blank canvas and he says, paint a beautiful picture. Um, Marilyn Robinson in the beautiful novel Gilead uh, has the preacher say at one point I have, an, I have the idea that at judgment we will be judged more uh, on how beautiful our lives were than how right or wrong our decisions were and so that's what I'm that's why I'm trying to use the analogy of a violin teacher who who isn't saying here this is my, the music I wrote and I want you to play my song it's more a matter of the teacher saying, I want you to be able to play so you can play your own music and write your own melodies. And uh, so that's why I believe that the, the closer we approach to God, the more diverse we will become, the more, more fully realized individuals we will become. Uh, as Brigham Young once thundered from the pulpit in the tabernacle, away with stereotyped Mormons. <laughs> so I think in a... In a broader sense, what he was saying is God isn't trying to create a bunch of clones. He's trying to create a bunch of children. I think he was just as progressive as his uh, predecessor. Yeah, I don't think he's fully appreciated. Uh, if you really just spend some time reading through his sermons. He's sometimes... not some narrow-minded Orthodox uh, prophet that just no, think... did everything that Joseph told him to do. You know. Yeah, I think he could be a pretty capacious thinker. Absolutely. Okay. Jumping. How much time do you have left? Uh, I'm fine. We can go. To okay. Life. Jumping back over to, um, and I feel bad because sister Givens isn't here to discuss the Christ who heals. I was laughing when I watched your interview where she 
kind of told you to pipe down. <laughs> yeah, that's not unusual. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, let me explain it. <laughs> um, the uh, Sozo, I was fascinated with this. Sozo and healing and how Sozo means healing and saved. That exemplifies the gospel we belong to today. This paradox in the church is trying to make sense of the atonement of Christ through a Protestant lens. Sozo is a Greek word meaning wholeness, wholeness in spirit, wholeness in soul. I love that. So judgment originally meant to discern. It wasn't a, 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 a harsh, narrow-minded God that's like, you know, externally judging us for our, every action we don't make right it was discerning yeah yeah there are lots of lots of varieties of that word in the greek text right there's krino there's katakrino there's diakrino uh most of all of them translated judgment but there are all these different shades and gradations of what is being meant and the root meaning generally is associated with yet discerning and uh, i i think this is one of the most beautiful and persistent motifs in the entirety of the bible right the first six creative days what characterizes the activity of God in, in each case. He's discerning, he's dividing, he's recognizing distinctions, establishing distinctions. And what are Adam and Eve, uh, what is their task in the garden? It's to make distinctions, it's to, to learn to differentiate the bitter from the sweet. What is our purpose as mortals? It's to learn to make these same kinds of, of distinctions. So it's and it's not about condemnation and judgment in terms of evaluation. You passed, you failed. It's it's more about discerning and recognizing. And you know, I think it's interesting, even in near-death experiences, right, of which thousands and thousands have been recorded and studied. Universally, people experience the moments after death as one of uh clarification and assessment mm -hmm. rather than judgment i'm right? glad you brought that up because i was thinking about that last night i was thinking should i bring that up to him i don't know if he's into that or not yeah yeah and by I the way i got crino and sozo mixed up those no, were two no, different no, no no you got it right no crino is judgment and sozo or sozo as it's pronounced sozo so yeah. um the root of that is to heal or to make whole and uh it's used dozens of times in the new testament it's used uh, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, especially when uh, a healing miracle is described. So in Mark 5, we find it when um, the woman touches the hem of his garment and is made whole. Matthew tells the same story in Matthew 9. Both cases, you've been sozoed, you've been healed or made whole. We find it in the story of the blind man in Mark 10, uh, repeated in Matthew 18. God touches his eyes, he makes him whole, sozo. But what, what is most significant to me is when we get to Luke and the story in Luke 7 of the woman who is forgiven for her many sins, Christ uses the identical phrase. Your faith has made you whole. You've been sozoed, so to speak. And so to me, that's one of the key indicators in the New Testament that that word sozo is meant to encompass a range of healing from physical to emotional to spiritual. And, uh, you know, Fiona and I had some of our research assistants do a quick word study of general conference talks. And we found that in the last 10 years, the brethren have used the word heal or healing 500% more frequently than in previous decades. So it seems to me there's a general recognition on the part of the leadership that uh, more emphasis needs to be placed on Christ as healer rather than as judge uh, or, um, you know, the forgiver of sins. Well, he has that role, but that seems to fall within the rubric of healing his people. The term ongoing restoration is meaning a lot more to me than it ever has been. We, we see, as Latter-day Saints, if we're born in a certain period within the last 192 years since the Restoration began, it seems like whatever uh, era that we're born in within that time span as Latter-day Saints, that's, we're, we're very myopic when it comes to how we see the gospel of Jesus Christ. According to the leaders that 
lived within our our vision and, and in our hearing at the pulpit or reading the ensign or, you know, there were things progressed. You mentioned even B.H. Roberts coining the phrase eternal progression. Yeah. That wasn't something. And even Joseph Smith, he he grew grace from grace. He you mentioned um, Alvin and his vision of the celestial kingdom. Uh, did he have a different idea of salvation? And and how did he how did he deal with that dichotomy in his mind before that that you know I, I've seen God I spoke with him but does he care does he care for my brother like I care for him and his salvation Yeah yeah there's no question that um, the entire restoration project to Joseph Smith has a very very personal dimension to it. Um, you know, we just can't comprehend the exposure to death that was the common experience of all people in the 19th century. Every, everybody over the age of 10 would have been personal witness to the burial of parents or siblings or, or close relatives. And uh, Joseph, we know how many of his own children he lost. Um, and the death of Alvin was to him uh, a crisis in his young life from which he never fully recovered. And so, yeah, we have this interesting dual experience in section 76, where he has this comforting vision of the degrees of glory, realizes that virtually everybody will receive uh, a kingdom of glory. And there's a description of the terrestrial kingdom that seems to fit the case of his brother, right? Those who died without a knowledge of the gospel, but would have accepted it. And so, you know, it seems to me reasonable to infer that at that moment, Joseph would have been comforted that Alvin was going to inherit a place in the terrestrial kingdom. Well, then a few years later, he has a vision of the celestial kingdom. And he remarks on being amazed, right? He's amazed. Why? Among other reasons, because he sees his brother Alvin in the celestial kingdom. And so... I, I, I'm, you know, I don't know for sure how we can read that, but it seems to me reasonable to assume that Joseph there learns that we're not necessarily locked into one place at the time of death, but there is room for growth and and progression even beyond the grave. And of course, section one thirty eight of the Doctrine and Covenants, midway through, we are told that the gospel is being preached not only to those who died without a knowledge, but it's also being preached to those who rejected the prophets um so clearly uh, that was at joseph f smith's um, was joseph f. Smith, revelation yeah. right so clearly there's an ongoing process of continuing repentance and growth and it's it, it's so important that we're hearing it again you know um with the fifth prophet joseph f smith you do you have some of the your favorites that you do quote i noticed that and that's a good thing um, and I noticed that they're educators and scholars. <laughs> yeah. Um, is that on purpose or is that just by happenstance? Oh, I, I think everybody has. Um, their right, favorites. Oh, well, I was going to use another word. <laughs> I was going to say <laughs> we all resonate, right? We're like strings on a harp and we That's all resonate right. to different frequencies. And uh I resonate more to, to some of those voices than, than to others. Nicely put, nicely put. Um, okay. So you, we were talking about near death experience. I don't want to get into a big to do about that, but I think you were making a point. It is true though. I've, I've been watching binge watching. I, you, it, you probably cringe. Well, you probably cringe at people using the word cringe now. Right. But also that people don't read as much as they used to. Um, but then again, I'm speaking for myself. I love knowledge, but my wife will read to me because I'm severely ADD, severely. Uh, but I love knowledge, okay? I'm very audiovisual. So we, we talk about near-death experiences. It's interesting that a lot of their depictions and their, um, their experiences in, include, like you said, not feeling this judgment upon them, 
but almost like a an invitation the, the invitation continues for them to embrace this light whenever they're ready to those who felt that they weren't worthy to be in the presence of god um even the book of mormon talks about we're taken back to that god who made us and i think about those who have near-death experiences they always say that they're taken back to christ or to that yeah. light almost like an intermittent is that the word intermittent intermittent right an inter thank you an intermittent judgment um that's interesting that um that we find that in some near-death experiences yeah and uh you know they're the overwhelming experience that they have and that they record is that of of just absolutely unqualified love and uh, i think it's beautiful that if you go to the 1832 account of joseph smith's first vision that's what stands out in his 1832 version right he was filled with this feeling of love that lingered with him for days after the experience how do those who maybe fear or don't understand intellect being a part of faith <laughs> how do how do we overcome that um <clears throat> by uh well i'm i'm reminded of you know the stories that are told you know back in the day back the 1930s through the 50s uh the, the leading thinkers of the church were often asked to, to write the manuals right with so and uh even hugh nibley was asked at one point and uh, i remember people express concern to president mckay well people won't be able to to follow him he, he's too lofty a thinker and his reply was let them stretch <laughs> and look i'm reading books every week that uh she's i'm stretching with you brother Gibbons. <laughs> i am stretching with you well I, I i i'm stretching every week when I'm reading books that presuppose a degree of knowledge uh, and proficiency that I don't have. Uh, I think, I think we need to be used to uh, discomfort and allow ourselves to be made uncomfortable by, by the stretch. Thank you so much for being here with us. I really appreciate it. Unless you want to talk more. Is there anything? No, I, you've asked good <laughs> questions. I, I've did said, I? I hope yeah. I did. Yeah. This is the book, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, boys and girls. It's called Let's Talk About Faith and Intellect. And it's also part of a series um, that the Maxwell Institute has. No, it's Deseret Book. Deseret Book. There's uh, about five or six different authors that have okay. these books. And it's, an it's I wouldn't say an easy read. It's a short read, but it's not an easy read. But it's a worthwhile read. Okay. It's it's beautiful. Now I read it, but now I'm going to go back and and nibble on it and feast upon it and dissect it and contemplate more on it. Um, and I want to should we leave the link to your website? Is that where people can get the other books? Uh, yeah, you... website is, would be okay. fine. Yeah, yeah, um, Christians.com. Yeah, so the Christ Who Heals was one that we were talking about. Uh, thank you so much. There's more I wanted to ask, but I, I'm just, uh, well, let me say this real quick. Hold on. So I wrote this down. We teach that faith is the catalyst for spiritual manifestation, whether it be miracles, testimony, or personal revelation. I would also like to add that intellect is the catalyst for interpreting spiritual manifestation. Uh, like I said before, Joseph stated that language was broken, yet he wanted more of it in his life. He organized the school of the prophets, and he used intellect to make sense of the Lord's revelations on paper. And we'll end on that, I guess. Unless I think you want to end, on. end on. No, I think that's I think that's lovely. It's um, you know, the first the first one of the first most important statements in Joseph Smith's history is uh, he expresses his frustration because the Protestant world of his day claimed the Bible was sufficient, the Bible was the source of all authority and anything that we needed. And he said, well, that's obviously false because everybody's arguing about it. <laughs> so right there, it seems to me you have the seeds of that idea that, that revelation itself is not always the answer. It's the basis for whatever answers we're seeking.
Yeah, even even uh, Leonard Arrington called us Holy Ghosters, right? <laughs> some of us, you know who Leonard Arrington is, right? Of course, yeah. I think he's kind of controversial in some aspects, but but I'm understanding that there's an a, another side to things and another story that can be told, and um, and like I said, we're we're speaking the same we're, we're speaking we might be speaking a different language but we're we're on the same team yeah you know what i mean yeah